So what is join order? So assume the following situation. You have three input relations and you want to join them. And then the option is if you have a join that can only take two input streams, you can make a decision whether to join C and B first. And whatever is the output, you join that with A. That's option number one or plan one as I call it. The other option is you join A and C first. And whatever the result is, you join that with B. Of course, if you, for instance, do not have a join predicate here, this will degenerate to a cross product. This might happen. And then it's a question whether it makes sense to consider that option anyhow. But assume you have join predicates available among C and B, and then a join predicate, of course, between the result and A. And you have a join predicate among A and C, and the result to B. So let's look at the different plans. What might happen here? Well, what I'm trying to tell you with this slide is the number of intermediate results that are produced. So assume that all of those three tables have a thousand tuples each. That is this number here. A thousand tuples go to the input. But the question is how many join results are produced on this side? Well, the cross product would have one million, of course. One thousand times one thousand is one million. However, it produces slightly less, only 10% of that, so 100,000 tuples are produced. Those 100,000 tuples are then the input to this join. So, of course, the number of tuples you feed into this join has a huge impact on the performance of this join. So, if you look at the alternative plan, it may look something like this. So, here we only have 100 tuples that are produced by this first join and we still have a thousand tuples here so we only have a hundred on the left one thousand on the right and this is the input to the join so it's likely that it is way cheaper to run this join than it is to run that join so if you assume that the costs for executing this join are the same as for executing that one we have a huge difference that is we expect that this join is more expensive than that join. So the join order here has an effect on the overall performance that we expect. And you can also examine that by examining the selectivities. So if we examine the selectivities here, and with that I mean the selectivity of this join operation, this has a selectivity of the number of results actually computed by the join, the 100,000 results, divided by the size of the cross product, the 1 million tuples. And that gives you a 10% selectivity. Here, on the right side with plan 2, we have a way higher selectivity. Again, remember this strange terminology with selectivities. It's a smaller number, therefore it's a higher selectivity. In other words, fewer tuples are returned by this operation. So this is way better. This is by a factor 1000 better than this one here. 100 results rather than 100,000. So this has to be kept in mind. This is important not only for joins. So this is important for all those operations that are commutative. Commutative and associative. This not only includes joins, but this also includes union. This includes intersection. Intersection is very important for search en engines. If you have different result lists in the search query, then you have a consideration like this. And of course, also cross products, which is just basically a join where the join predicate is true. Cross products. And there you have this option to make a decision about the order that you use to combine different relations. And another challenge then is once you come up with this plan, let's assume we are there, the question is how do you actually get the data from input relation A? So in the chapter on indexing, we already talked about the different options we had there. So of course you could always scan all of the input and that is what I'm trying to visualize here. So basically this is saying you're scanning all of relation A from disk or from memory or whatever storage medium you're using and then you run all of that. 
But of course, as you remember the chapter on indexing, we could also use some sort of index, so, which means we combine those two expressions into an index axis. So if we have an index that uses the name attribute as a key, this might be a very good idea. So it would be nice to rewrite it. However, the question occurs, well, what type of index should be used here? So there are many, many indexes, as we learned about already in the chapter on indexing. This could be a clustered index, for example. And then we have this effect that we have the same sequential layout of the leaves here and the actual data pages. This is symbolized here with those parallel lines here. However, maybe it's a situation that you have an unclustered index and then those arrows go potentially crisscross. Or oh, there's another option, maybe there's a covering index which means it does not only implement the selection and the actual access to table A, but also implements the projection. So if title, ID and name are all covered in this covering index, there's no need anymore to go to the actual store. All the information you ever require to answer this query to compute the result of this query is already available in this index. In this situation, we are also calling this an index only plan. Index only plan. And this is very attractive for a query optimizer because we do not have to go to the store to fetch any data. And at this point in time, the problems only start because the question is okay, so when should we use those indexes? Because those indexes may lead to very different costs. For instance, let's look at the clustered index. What is the co cost of looking up the clustered index? Let's assume it's a disk-based system. So let's throw in a cost model. Let's assume we need like one random I.O. to fetch the leaf. So I assume that all of the top of this tree sits in my memory. I don't have any feelable costs for getting down to the leaf, but then maybe I have to fetch the leaf node from disk that triggers one random I.O. So that's one random I.O. And then I still have to go to the store that will trigger another run random I.O. And then I can do the ISIM, the index sequential access method on the store, which basically can be considered to be sequential. So you could say maybe it's two random I.O.s. It's a little oversimplified. Actually, there might be more random I.O.s involved, but as a model, I think it's fine for the moment. So two random I.O.s plus a sequential access plus sequential. Let's write it down. Okay. It, however, if it's an unclustered index, recall, well, maybe it's the same thing. All of this sits in the database buffer already. It's in my memory. No feedable costs for that. Maybe just the cost to fetch the leaf that is similar to the clustered index. One random I.O. to fetch the leaf, one random I.O. to fetch the data page from the store. However, then it's not exactly ISIM anymore. Because the problem here is that potentially for every tuple that qualifies on the leaf level of the index, you may trigger a random I.O. to fetch the stuff from the data store. Because, recall, the major property of the unclustered index is that the sort order of the keys in the leaf does not necessarily correspond to the sort order of the data pages in the store. Which means, in the worst case, for every tuple that qualifies on the leaf level here, you have to perform a random lookup in the store. This may be super expensive and this may totally ruin performance of a database system. Therefore, you should be very careful when using unclustered indexes, especially in a disk-based system, because they may lead to problems. Well, the third option, what is the cost for the covering index here? We gain basically that we do not have to access the store. So it's basically one random I.O. to fetch the leaf, assuming that all of that again sits in my memory. And then it's ISAM on the leaf level, no need to go to the store. So it's basically one random I.O. only one random I.O. better than the clustered index even. And then you do a sequential access. This is the best option here in this case, if this index exists. Well, basically the query optimizer has to make a decision on that. If you go back here, so there was the initial situation we were in and we said, okay, we want to rewrite that and we want to exploit an index. Of course, that is not something the database administrator does. 
This is a decision that is automized. This is done by the query optimizer. The machine makes a decision which index to use. And of course, when the machine makes a decision, it should be careful not to make things worse, worse than the full scan, for example. A full scan is typically the lower bound, the worst you can do in a database system. So when you do an index access, you want to improve upon the scan-based access. And the query optimizer has to be very careful, especially with the unclustered indexes here, because here the number of tuples that qualify have a linear relation to the number of random I.O. you perform on the data store. So if you just look up one tuple here, you trigger one random I.O. on the data store. However, if you look up a thousand tuples in the unclustered index, you may potentially trigger a thousand different random IOs on the data store, and that may be super expensive. So if you assume you only have an unclustered index on a.name, so that is what we had here, that is the same unclustered index as in this slide. So now let's assume the query optimizer makes a decision among those two options, adjust the scan on A or use the unclustered index which may on first sight look trivial. You would say, okay, well, I should use the index. It's clear I must use the index because the index will, it's likely to be faster. However, that depends highly on the selectivity. And that is depicted here in this graph. So here I'm depicting the selectivity. This means here in the root of the graph, I have few results that are returned. Here, many results are returned. And the two different plans here basically have the following costs. The scan is not affected by selectivity. So the, so the scan has constant costs. You have to read all of relation A. So on both disk-based and main memory system, this is what dominates your overall cost. It's basically constant. It's a little over-idealized, but it's basically constant. The unclustered index, however, is super great if you only have few results. That might be a very small region here. And then the problem for the query optimizer is to find this spot. So what the query optimizer basically does is it tries to fetch the best of all of the worlds here. In this case, the best of both worlds. So if the selectivity is in this region, the query optimizer will use the unclustered index. If it's higher than this cutoff point, it will use the scan. That is the decision the query optimizer is trying to take. However, it might be difficult to get the right point in time here. So what sometimes happens in database systems is you do an estimate for this cutoff point that is wrong. Assume you estimate it to be here. And then the query optimizer might say, okay, if I'm in this range, I will use the unclustered index. If I'm above that, I will use the scan. If we try to find the intersection point, we are here. It's almost twice the cost of the scan. So by using the index here, we might be a factor two slower than the original scan. This might happen in query optimization. So when developing query optimizers, it's very important to avoid these kind of situations. You may ruin the performance over the scan. The scan is always the baseline. And whatever you do, you try to improve upon that. You try to be in this region. And that is what the art and the difficulty and the challenges of query optimizations is about. Okay, to sum up, in this video, I try to give you some intuition, some feeling on the different challenges that exist in query optimization. So how that all works in detail or to a certain degree of detail, we will look at in the following videos. If you liked this video, don't forget to hit the like button. Thank you. So if you want to see more database videos, be it in English or in German, take a look at my website datenbankenlernen.de it has a couple of English and German videos. You can also subscribe to my YouTube channel, Jens Did, or you look at our website, infosys.uni-saarland.de. See you there.